Previously, we saw how a basic, fully connected neural network can be used to classify motions. Neural networks come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and have a variety of uses. In this lecture, we'll explore a popular network used for image classification, that is, the convolutional neural network. A convolutional neural network, also known as a CNN or ConvNet, consists of a series of operations that automatically find and pick out features or patterns in the input data. This is what makes it so useful for image analysis and classification. Even though a CNN can have other layers or nodes to assist with the filtering and classification, what makes it unique is these convolution layers. The convolution layers contain filters whose parameters are updated just like the parameters in regular neural network nodes. That means they are trainable using backpropagation. These filters are applied to an image and automatically pick out various features. These include things like broad shapes, such as obvious circles and repeating patterns like fur, grass, or wood grain. They can also pick out edges, such as the border between two objects. This is known as edge detection. You normally see CNNs with more than one convolutional layer, and each subsequent layer picks out more complex features than the last. These later layers start to pick out things like ears, eyes, noses, and other complex shapes. With enough layers, it might start to identify whole faces, people, animals, cars, trees, and so on. Each convolution layer consists of a number of filters. The default in edge impulse is eight filters for this first layer. The image, or the matrix of MEL frequency septal coefficients in this case, is copied to each of these filters. After filtering and max pooling, which we'll talk about in a minute, the output of each node is copied to the input of every other node in the next layer, just like we do for our dense neural network layers. If the next layer consists of 16 filters, those eight output images get copied to every filter, so now we have to store 128 images. With large images, you can see how this quickly begins to take up memory and processor time as we go from one image to eight, then 128 different images as output from these filters. The filtering process and max pooling steps decrease the size of each filtered image, which does help with memory and processor usage. Let's see how these filters work. We'll go back to our puppy photo. Let's make it grayscale because that's easier to conceptualize for now. Now let's zoom in on a portion of this photo. Each pixel, assuming it's grayscale, is just a number. In larger machine learning settings, these might be transformed to floating point values and normalized to be between 0 and 1. I won't fill out all of these numbers, but you can imagine how these would represent each pixel. A filter, also known as a kernel, is just a matrix with parameters that multiply the pixel values. These products are then summed together to form a new value, which becomes one pixel in the new filtered image. If you're familiar with matrix math, this is the dot product. This filter with the same parameters then slides over and performs the exact same operation on the next set of pixels, calculating a new pixel value for these nine original pixels. The filter continues to do this for the entire image, creating a new filtered image. This filtering process using a multiply and sum kernel is known as convolution. Note that this is a 3x3 three three kernel for a two-dimensional convolution filter. Changing the kernel size is a hyperparameter that you can play with to see if it makes the image classifier perform better. The multiplier values in the kernel are the parameters. These get updated automatically during the training process to help the whole model learn which features are best for classification. In a convolutional neural network, we often pass each pixel of this output image through some kind of nonlinear function known as activation. Often, you'll see the rectified linear unit used, which just drops all negative values of the resulting image. This helps make any features stand out even more. 2D convolution is a very time-consuming process, as you generally use a small kernel to go over the entire image. Sometimes that's not needed, and we can use a kernel that's the same size as the image in one dimension. We call this one-dimensional convolution. Let's take our MFCCs as an example. This looks like a grayscale image, as it's just a 2D matrix of number values. The colors in the image you see here were added for effect by edge impulse, as they can help you spot large differences between values. The reds are warmer, and therefore higher in magnitude than the blues. A 1D convolution filter, or kernel, looks like this. Our image is 13 pixels wide by 49 pixels long. You have two options here for a filter. You can create one that goes top to bottom or one that goes side to side. For MFCCs, we want one that goes side to side in order to keep the temporal information encoded in the matrix as the frequency bands change over time. So we end up with a kernel that's 13 pixels wide. We can play with the length, but the default and edge impulse is 3 pixels long, so 
so we'll stick with that. Just like before, the filter takes the dot product of its parameters and the pixel values underneath it. That value is stored and the filter slides over to perform the dot product again. It continues this for the whole set of MFCCs. Note that the output of each filter step in this first layer is a 1 by 49 element array with each pixel denoting a feature at each time slice. Now that we have eight different filtered images, each denoting a set of features from the one original image, we need to perform a max pooling step. You'll often find max pool or average pool layers in CNNs to help reduce the size of the filtered images, which helps keep the computational costs down. A max pooling layer starts out similar to convolution. We apply a window to our image. Rather than compute the dot product, however, we just pick the highest number in that pool. In this case, it would be 0.38. If we were using average pooling, we'd average all of the pixel values in the window together to produce one number. Remember that we're applying this to the output of the convolution layer, so this would be a filtered image. We then move the window over and repeat the process, finding the highest value in that pool. You can choose to overlap or hop the filter as much as you want. The less overlap you have between windows, the more you'll compress the image. While you might save on computations down the road, you might throw away features, so it often takes some experimentation to find a window size and hop length that works well for your application. As before, this process continues for the whole image. Note that this is a two-dimensional max pooling process. Because we're working with one-dimensional arrays as the output of our convolution step, we can easily do a one-dimensional max pooling step. Here, a window is applied over a subset of pixels in the array. The maximum value of those pixels is stored into the output array. The pool slides or hops over and it repeats the process for the whole array. Note that in edge impulse, the default window size is one by two pixels and it hops two pixels, which creates an array half the size of the original. If you're wondering what happens if there are an odd number of pixels Edge Impulse pads an extra zero to the front or back of the original array to make it even. This is to prevent dropping some values if the window hops don't perfectly line up. That's how we can get an output of 25 pixels even if the input is 49. You'll normally see max pooling layers after each convolution step to help keep the resulting filtered image size small. We repeat this convolution and max pooling step as many times as we think is necessary. In our edge impulse example, we'll see it happen twice. Note that the second convolution layer has 16 nodes instead of 8, like in the first. The second max pooling layer effectively halves the array size again, so we're left with a 1 by 13 element matrix at the output of each node. With 16 nodes, that gives us 16 1 1 by 13 matrices. The final part of a CNN is almost always a classifier, which is usually a simple dense neural network with any number of layers. The first part picks out the relevant features and the second part classifies those features. Because the classifier expects a one-dimensional input, we must first flatten our 16 arrays into one long array. So we just stack them end to end before sending them to the classifier. If the arrays were two-dimensional or three-dimensional matrices instead, they would also be flattened out to give us our one-dimensional input. The classifier works just like the neural network we saw in our accelerometer demo. In fact, the default classifier portion in Edge Impulse is even simpler. It's just four nodes, one node corresponding to each of our labels. The 1 by 208 element array is copied to each node, where the node multiplies each element by a weight, sums them together, and adds a bias term. This sum is sent to the softmax function, which mixes the output from the four nodes to give us our class probabilities. Much like with our dense neural network, we can use backpropagation to train the entire model. This training process will update the convolution filter parameters as well as the weights and bias terms in the fully connected layer of the classifier. When it's done, we should be able to feed the MEL frequency sepstral coefficients to this model and have it predict the class it belongs to. In your Edge Impulse project, head to the Neural Network Classifier page. Take a look at the Neural Network architecture. It should look very much like what we just saw in the slides. The output layer contains the four fully connected neural network nodes and the softmax layer. You're welcome to click on a layer and click the Edit button to change its shape and size. However, the default settings should work well for our speech recognition application, so let's leave everything alone for now. Click the Start Training button. While that's going, let's talk about these dropout layers, which we did not look at earlier. Earlier. 
These layers can be added in between other layers to help prevent overfitting. They cause a certain percentage of outputs from the previous layer to be completely ignored during training. In this case, 25% of the outputs from the pooling layers are ignored. The nodes in the next layer, in effect, have to take on more responsibility for the remaining input. Normally, which outputs are dropped are randomly chosen before each sample makes a forward pass in the network during training. This makes the training process noisy and can often help with overfitting. Note that they are only applied during training and are not in effect during deployment. If you see your neural network start to overfit the training data, you can add dropout layers similar to how you would add regularization terms. Feel free to play around with them and their dropout percentage. When training is done, take a look at the loss and accuracy scores in the output. Do you spot any overfitting or underfitting? Take a look at your confusion matrix. How did your model perform on the validation data? If you're happy with the results, head over to model testing. Click the checkbox to select all the samples in the test set and click classify selected. Wait a moment while that classifies your samples. Once that's done, scroll through the results to see how well your model performed on unseen data. Are the results consistent, or do you see any patterns of misclassified words? An accuracy of 90 to 95% is usually pretty good. Something in the 85% range will work for this demo, but it might need some tweaking before you actually deploy it in production. If you're happy with the results of the test set, we're ready to deploy the model to our embedded system.